move forward a little bit and then I'll move back. So I want to start with these cards. Everyone should have a card. Does everyone have one that has a green side and a pink side? So this is the teacher part of me. We were 27 years of teaching. So you have yes is green. And because I didn't have any red ones, pink is maybe not. Maybe not true, maybe false, maybe I'm having problems with this. So just remember that as we go forward. So I want to start back. How many of you know what the Department of Education Diagnostic Centers are? Oh, okay. Yay. So there's three of us. We are an arm of the CDE. There's one in LA, one in the Central, and I come from the one in the North, the green one. And yes, I have traveled to every single county now, and that is how I learned my counties. Because I've been to every one. I made to Alturas, I went to Modoc County last year, first time ever in Alturas. Alturas is very different than here. They have the flashing light, and that's it. There's no other stoplights in that town. So think about that being very, very different, and how transition might look for a child there, and transition might look for a child here. We serve um, 450 school districts in Northern California. We do assessments, and I did see some people I recognize, so that means I probably assessed your child at one time. Um, we all specialize students, not just children with developmental disabilities, but all children from 3 to 22. One of the things that is really nice is we're free. Hey, well, we're free within tax dollars free, but we are free. And um, we provide training and consultations as well. So if you're interested in the Diagnostic Center Services, please see. Now I also have with us Jill Larson, who is part of, who is the leader of our transition COP, and Jill's going to come up and talk a little bit about uh, the COP right now. I told her she was slide three, just realized I talk very fast. So <laughs> here you go, Jill. <laughs> And if you 
have any questions, feel free to ask me. I will be here afterwards as well. And let's move forward. All right, so Jack Sparrow, Captain Jack Sparrow, one of my favorite uh, <laughs> people. <laughs> Loosely quoted this. Loosely, because I don't think he used the word transition. But transition assessment is more what you would call guidelines and actual rules. Because there really aren't a whole lot of rules, but we have a ton of guidelines I'm willing to share with you. So what is it? This is what it is. It is transition assessment is really just an umbrella term that encompasses all types of assessments. There isn't just a single assessment that you would use. There's a multitude. There's books. There's online. There's all kinds. We're going to get to them tonight. What's really important is that if someone says to you, this is the only one we use, then you need to talk. You need to either have them call me, or I'm going to give you resources tonight that you can show them. So here's your first question using your cards again. I just gave you the answer. Transition, what do you think? The transition assessment process is developed using a specific protocol at each school, and it's important to follow the same protocol for each student. Is that true or false? Yay! It's false. Let me tell you why. Many schools believe this, it's been documented, it's been researched that many schools do use the same protocol, and I don't want to know if your school does that, but it's just <laughs> something that you should be thinking about. In reality, assessments should be developed with each student in mind. Each student is very much an individual, and one assessment will not work for them. The key thing about assessments is that you have to have student participation. You cannot do transition assessment without the student. Key piece. So, overall transition assessment, the overall purpose is to identify students' interests and preferences, which is in law. That is the one thing. It is to help determine those post um, school goals and options that I think Sue Sawyer probably went into the first one, and someone else will go into after me in regards to goals. You have to develop uh, relevant learning experiences, such as instruction and transition service needs. You're going to also identify supports and linkages, and you're going to evaluate um, instruction and support. That is what the purpose of uh, transition assessments are. So that's why you can see how one tool is not going to be able to do that. If we look at what drives transition, it really is assessment. You start with the assessment, and that has to be age-appropriate assessments that lead to your measurable post-secondary goals. How many of you know what a measurable post-secondary goal is? Ooh, not as many. Oh, we have some. Okay, some people don't have a month. What does that mean, like this? Um, a measurable post-secondary goal are the goals that must be written on your transition plan. And that's loose, again, that's really loose. Please don't quote me on that. But they're, again, goals is when, Patty? When is that training on goals? Next. No, one after that. <laughs> Really important that you attend this one because with assessments set it all up. So you have the goals ready to be written, and then after you have the goals written, then you'll know what transition services and what course of study that child will be following. I love this graphic. And yes, I made it that nice. Next. Question number two. Transition assessments are primarily for youth with severe disabilities. Ooh, this is not as clear. 
me, all the people don't know. If you don't know, a little bit, no one can see you. Only I can see you, and I can come to you and say, no, you're wrong. Uh, it is. Which one is it? It is not a one-time thing right before the IEP. Not that I've done that. But it is. Over time, assessments must be done over time, at least annually. It must include the student in here. And it, it should be ongoing. And you can use many different ones. You shouldn't just use one assessment one time every year. You do that interview with the student. What do you want to be when you grow up? And you write that down. It's not enough. You have to do a battery of assessments. You sh I shouldn't say have to. You should do. Because again, guidelines versus rules. Assessment should lead to self-discovery. However, questions like, who am I? What are my unique talents and interests? What do I do now? What do I do in the future? Are really difficult for many of our students, difficult for many students. So the transition assessment process helps students begin to look at that. So when they're, we know none of us, what, here's this, do any of us have the same job we did when we were um, seniors in high school? so well and I've had it gone terribly wrong, but we 
we went back and fixed it when it goes terribly wrong. I'm going to talk about a couple of these. And these are the methods that are out there, person uh, futures planning. And that one is focused and driven by students' strengths and interests, focused on the cap capabilities and opportunities. It's flexible, dynamic, and formal. It requires a team. All these require a team. The making action plans, which I'm going to show you some pictures, has this focused on like questions. Here's a young man with his action plan. That teacher's an artist. You don't have to be an artist to do this. I've done it. Um, but it really just plans out this child's next steps in life. And there's seven questions when you're looking at um, maps. And they are, what is the individual's history? What are their dreams? What are the nightmares? We actually ask that question in maps because it's really important to say, what are the nightmares and how do we stop that from happening? Um, what are the needs? What are the individual strengths? And what would your ideal school look like? What would your ideal next steps look like? And you sit together as a community of people and you create these. I actually, there's actually one on 60 Minutes that I can no longer play on my computer, it's so old. But it really talks about, it shows how a family all came together to support a child with autism, move on to their next steps. And at one point there was an employer there who said, I can work with this child and, and when he becomes an adult, he can work in my store. And these are, he needed to know what skills that child possessed and that was um, said at their maps meeting. It can start at any age. It doesn't have to start at 16. Mapping can be done in fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, especially nice when they go into middle school and then from middle school to high school. It, it's the whole family. It's a community that comes together. Richard, ah, I've lost his name. Rosenberg. Rosenberg does an amazing job. This is his, one of his kids. He does one for every single one of his kids. And he's from Whittier. If you want to call him, go ahead. Um, <laughs> he is, he and his wife do amazing maps. And every single one of his kids have them as they graduate and they, they come together as families. And it's, and they answer those seven questions and those kids are ready to move on. And it's all different levels. It's not just for kids with severe disabilities. It can be for any student, any, including my student. Person Center Planning is the guiding principle of um, transition. It really is without it, you know, there, there can't be an accurate understanding of who this child is. Because if you leave the family out, you leave their community out, you've missed a huge piece of that child. And we always want to do this transition assessments in a vacuum, just with you and the child sitting there and writing things down. And you forget that this child brings a lot of other supports with them. And when they leave you, either at they, when they age out or when they graduate, who is going to support that student? It's going to be that, those people that were at this MAPS meeting or part of the student's life. So we have to remember to pull them in when we're doing assess when we're doing transition assessment. To leave them behind is a huge chunk of the student. Even a student who might be going on to college, might be on to, going on to community college. My first question is, when I work with a child going on to community college, how are you getting there? And the first answer they give me, my mom's driving me. And the mother looks at me and goes, no, no. So those are, those are some questions that are real basic. We don't think of them because we don't always encourage families during an IEP process because an IEP process is very much, you know, the teacher sitting down writing the goals. This is different. Assessments, you can, be, you can bring in the whole family. Okay, four, question number four. Age-appropriate assessments include only standard-based assessments that will render a valid and reliable source. Oh, so I'm giving you the question. You're correct. It is false. False. Ah, oh, yay. Age-appropriate transition assessments include formal and informal measures. You can use observations. You can use checklists. You can use non-standard, informal. I'm going to go over a few of them. How many of you have used Formal assessments. Can you go? Oh, yay, using these things. I'm talking about. Um, can anyone tell me a few you might have used? It's quiet, I know, but I'm trying to make you talk so you don't fall asleep. Go ahead. That's formal. That's very formal. The Wolfpack Johnson, the WJ. Is that a transition assessment? Can be. Can be, absolutely. What else have we used? We have no teachers here? Brigands. The brigands, yay, thank you. That's a curriculum. What, is there any informal ones you might have used? Uh, I 
find other people out here who know this answer. <laughs> crickets, you know, I hear crickets. <laughs> okay, I'll move forward then. Really? <laughs> so let's move to types that there might be out there. Assessment is most effective when it leads to reflection, exploration, and preparation, and they must include students. You think I'm kidding about this, but I have been uh, there and pulled the transition plans and talked with teachers. When they come to me as a referral, I'm going, who filled out this um, transition plan? I did. The teacher will say, oh, did, you have, did you take in consideration the student? No. <laughs> so you do have to include the student when you're doing transition plans. I know none of the teachers here would ever do that. Uh, so let's talk about standardized testing. WJ is a standardized test. It does academic testing. Typical of most kids. Uh, when we get into high school, we don't have to do them anymore, right? IDA states that once you've had an assessment over a period of time, you don't have to do formal assessments, right? Of high school teachers are going, oh, you're wrong. Read. Um, we can usually take what's, what hap happens over the past, and we don't have to do them as formally as we used to. Okay. Okay, don't say Kathy, Tony said that, I'll get in huge trouble up there. Um, but those standard testings are the ones that are done. Everyone does them. Um, we have the speech and language pathologist comes in with their tests. We have the OT comes in with theirs. The site comes in with theirs. The teachers come in with theirs. Those are the standards. We can still use them. Yes. I'm incorrect. Well, I, I have a problem with you saying when they hit high school, you don't do the you still do them. And test assessments because. Kids change, mm -hmm. and they, they better be making growth. And if they're not making growth, the standardized assessments can help you sometimes figure out what's going on. And you need to know exactly where that kid is when they're going to graduate or they hit 22. So I, I tell my districts, Good. You, you, they have to do it. They can't just do a file review. They, this is, the file review is what is said in Edco, but I'm here. this woman is from also CDE. She is a consultant in the secondary area. Let, we'll let her answer that question. Yes, you must do that from now on because it is important to get um, levels. I totally agree with you. I am just stating what might be done in the districts. <laughs> so you might ask his parents, but he's current. And so that would be what you would do. The other ones we have are interviews. And I've given you one in what's called Take Charge for the Future. This came out in the 80s when self-determination first came through California from Dr. Lori Powers out of the University of Oregon Health and Science, wherever that one is. Do you have that one with you? Take charge for the future. Did everyone get that? It's been updated in 2005. They got it. Yeah. So pull that out. This is one of the hundreds that you can find online. But this one was one of the very beginning ones. If you give this to your teachers I mean, or to your kids, I like giving one to, the, one to my student and then one to the parent of that student. And I like to see the differences. Because, I mean, some of them, I, mean, I think there's like a telephone on there no longer used or maybe the library no longer used. But they're still just really basic interviews. And you can do this individually and sit with the student. You can do it as a class. You can do it as a small group. There are many ways to use these interviews. But from this interview, you can say that the child was part of the assessment. Has anyone ever used the take charge one? Is it? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And, um, but there are millions of them out there, millions of interviews. This one's just fun because it has yes, no, smile face, no. You can make your own. It's just an interview that tells you a little bit about the skills that the student has. And you can build goals from this. The student does not know how to write public transit. And you're the workability director, and you're sending them off to a job. One of the goals could be to learn to um, use public transit and all the steps that go with it. So then you're going to also ask the RSP teacher to teach the student math or how to get a RT card or whatever they're called here. The VTA here? No, that's San Jose. Um, I don't know what, what, what your terms is. It's RT. RT. An RT pass. Thank you. An RT pass. How do you get that? Who pays for it? Uh, we, all those things are really important, and so it starts using critical thinking skills as well. So this inter this simple interview can take it can take transition um, very very deep. So it's helpful. Um, direct observation is another one, but it should occur in national settings such as school, employment places, community. That's direct observation of a child working, accessing his um, classroom, 
going to a job site, whatever they might be doing. Observation is transition assessment. Functional skills assessment. What is the minor one uses? The AMS, EBAS, adaptive rating skills. That's one. Is there another one? No one knows the rating skills, adaptive rating scales. There's quite a few of them out there you can use. Um, and curriculum based assessment is the brigands. Portfolio, choice maker. Um, all these are assessments that happen over time. There is a new brigands. I just ordered it for our center. Does anyone know that new brigands is now what? Aligned with? <laughs> and it's transition, so that's why I want it. But all the other, the new ones are. It's not aligned with California, of course not, because we're always different. Um, but that most of it is aligned with Common Core, not the seven percent, I guess, that we have changed. Um, other ones are transition inventory, such as the TPI. I have the TPI here. It is a very formal, and I'm going to pass one out as long as I get them back. Um, that we use, we give one to the school, one to the parent, and one to the student. And they go through it, it's very, very in-depth. And from that, you can get a strengths and weakness. So that's patterns of strength and weakness you would use here. The other one is supports intensity scale, and that's used with ARC. And that will tell you what level of support a child needs in different um, communities, such as a job um, at, in the community, at school, in the home with mobility. It's a very, it's a really nice um, scale. Has anyone used it? I've used it only once. It's intensive. It does take a lot of time, but it will give you everything you know, especially if you're in the 18 to 22 year old program and that child's going off to like a group home. And you can give all that information to a group and you can, you can know what level that child will need. And that's what ARC uses it for. Yes? I'm, I'm sorry to regress, but is that TPI Mm -hmm. Assessment available? Today? Yes. And you just have to ask. Your, uh, TPI is probably, I don't know who, we haven't talked about who's going to do all these yet. But um, the TPI is available, um, it's through, I think it's Pro Ed, so it is available to order. It's not just available uh, as an online, free online assessment, but you can order it. Okay. And it doesn't require you to have, I think it's a level. B as far as um, qualifications. Um, career vocational assessments, we know we have the um, occupational aptitude scale, ONET, career inventories, LCC, LCCE, that has been around a very long time. However, it's excellent, it's time, it is over time. Has anyone seen the LCCE? No. No, it's been out there, it comes out of the Torah. I think it's been at least since I've been around, so that's a very long time. Um, and those are, these are some ones that are pretty typical that are being used across the state right now in schools that I go to. The ones that are different are when we add to family, when we add parents. When we talk about maps, we talked about that. The TPI, again, involves the family. We also have just informal questionnaires. Really important to think about culture when we're working with our families. Transition is not always um, viewed as, um, I'm trying to think of the right word here, I just lost it, as it's just viewed differently across cultures. Know your cultures, know your people who you're working with, understand that many kids are staying home now. My 30-year-old came home, <laughs> so I understand children staying home. So it's different than it was maybe when we were in school and we went straight to work and moved out of our mom's house as quick as we could. So it's, it's different and children are staying home and that's an okay thing, but what does transition look like if you're going to stay at home? And that's, um, there are different um, uh, interviews for that. You can also do observation of kids who are out at job sites. Why would you not do observations of kids at that, where they're out at job sites? This is what they're going to be doing. This is their next steps. You need to get um, evaluations from the employers. Are those kids on time? Can those kids follow a two-step direction? Can they follow a three-step direction? Can they follow a written schedule? How many times did I have to go find them when they were off task? Those are the things that you can look for because those are skills every child needs. Everyone in my office needs. We all need those basic soft skills and they can only be taught in the natural occurring environment. It's really hard to teach employment soft skills 
when people are not employed. You can talk about them. We can, you know, role play them, but it's not the same as when you're on site. You can um, use your um, vocational assessment forms also from Ventura County. You can use ROP, so ROP, students can access ROP if they're in the K-12 system, just as any other student can. I had that question today. I started off as an ROP teacher. I know anyone can access ROP. And when they tell you they can't, talk to me. Call me and I will call them. Call Clay at the, the CDE, he knows it as well. But ROP is an excellent way to get those soft skills as well as um, skills. Workability is another way. How many of you know what workability is? Oh, yeah, we can use these. <laughs> oh, okay, Jill. <laughs> you had to think of. <laughs> workability is our, um, so almost everyone, who did, did anyone have pink up? Some people, some people did have pink up, okay. Workability is what used to be called learn, earn, to, learn to earn, earn to learn. It was a job vocational placement um, program through our schools. It is an excellent program. It goes into the classroom, it works with kids on job readiness skills, kids are placed out in the community at jobs, um, sometimes they're paid through workability, sometimes they're paid through the um, site itself. They, they can provide job coaches. So this is a program you need to get to know if it's on your campus. It doesn't start until the age of 16. And not every district has one, nor are they required to have one. But many, many, many districts do. And those can teach all those skills, and they already have all the skills um, on the back of their um, certificates as to what those students learn. And that's a really important piece of paper to bring to the next step, to your employer, to a community college, to whatever you're doing. And part of their, um, as a, I also was a workability director, part of it is getting ready kids, getting kids ready for work. Not just vocationally, but getting them ready for work as to what it means to be an employee at all different levels. And they also, ROP, I will have to ROP a little bit, um, they also, ROP has a um, connection with their community college, Workability often has a connection with the community college, so getting kids ready to take those next steps on many different levels. We also have our um, situational and environmental assessments. This is one of my favorites, and that's when you take the data of each step a child takes in a task. So whether that means getting on a bus, using a locker, stapling packets, all those things are, you can you can step by step by step, because you know task analysis, I like task analysis, because you always forget a task, like, oh yeah, I did that, I would forget it, and then my, my um, packet wouldn't turn out right. So can a student staple packets in the front office? You would go and you would watch that, and do a step by step by step, and you could catch where that student might be making a mistake and help them out. And do they ask for help after they made that mistake is a key piece of getting, you know, being successful the next steps. These are all transition assessments because they all start to tell a story about this child. So we have the WJ that they're going to be doing annually. We have the interviews that we did with them. We did some parent and family questionnaires. And now we're doing some environmental assessments that has all painted this gigantic picture of who this student is, what their next steps might look like, where their strengths and weaknesses lie. We have basic vocational assessments. We have a community-based um, checklist and profiles. All those things are available. So now that you have the whole list of what, um, sorry, I have to go back to the microphone, sorry. You have your whole list of, and your toolkit of what you're going to bring with you. How do you go ahead and conduct an assessment? Do I have any questions so far because I speak fast? So this is um, brought to you by NSTTAC, which of course is NASDAQ to me, but is the National Transition Technical Assistance Center. And they are from North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina. Dr. David Test was, is, is he currently still um, director of this? Uh, their funding has ended, they reapplied. Okay, so hopefully, but their work is still evidence-based and the work is still really good. I have roughly adapted this because it's pages and pages, so I just rough, so it's one slide. 
So one, your assessments must allow an individual to demonstrate his or, his or her own abilities and potentials. That means you must give the student um, the assessment in the way that they can access it. So you can't give a pencil paper test to someone who might not use pencil or paper. You might have to give it to them verbally. You might have to have them use a switch. You might have to do choices. We talked about that before. But you can't expect all assessments to fit all students' needs. You have to have assessment. A method should occur in the environment that resemble the actual environment. That's my sentence. He said it very nicely, but this is what that meant. So you have to make sure that and if you have a child getting on the bus, you can't fake that in your classroom. You have to actually have the student get on the bus. I was in a classroom the other day where they were pretending to watch a movie and they actually made pretend popcorn and they passed the pretend popcorn around. I'm like, no, <laughs> that assessment is not valid because it wasn't in a natural occurring environment. It has to occur where it's going to happen. Um, assessment methods must produce outcomes that contribute to the planning, development, and implementation for next steps. Don't give an assessment just to give an assessment. Make sure that it's meaningful and it's going to produce what, you know, something that is going to be in that child's assessment um, planning. Okay? Assessment methods should be varied and happen over time. Don't keep using the same one over and over and over again. It should be varied. It should occur over time. Use multiple measures to get the best picture of that student you possibly can. Let's see, assessment should um, to be verified by more than one method. So let's say you do an assessment in the classroom of a child making a sandwich or a child making pizza. You're going to make sure that when they go on their job site, they can do the exact same thing. That's how you move over different environments. Um, assessment data should be synthesized and interpreted for the parent and the student. So you have all this data and it looks great and you're ready to move forward, but you gotta share it with the student because it's what? Bye or with the student. So it's important that they know their patterns of strengths and weaknesses too. That's part of self-determination. Assessments, um, data, and results must be documented. That's a must. And that must be documented on the transition plan or ITP or in the IEP, however you're documenting it. You must document what you used, how you used it, and how, well, that's not true. You must document that the student was involved and how they were involved. I would print it all out as to what I use, what, what, what happened, and then synthesize it all in a paragraph or two. Any questions over how you might do a transition assessment? This is an amazing book. It's old. 2005 updated, but I think it started back again, like when I started, 87. You can download it, or you can read it online. It's a quick book of transition assessments. I'll pass it around. Um, it's still relevant. It has everything you need in here. Everything we just talked about is in here. The who, what, and why. Um, all, every assessment, every note to man is in here. Um, the one that I like, which, which is in the very, very back, and you'll see that it's highlighted, is the checklist to make sure the student and family have covered everything. And here's your check, your transition checklist as far as assessments go. It's all in here. Uh, again, you can download it from, I'm hoping you can download it from that site. I downloaded it about a year ago. You know, Sites do change, but you might want to check it out. Does anyone have an iPhone they can check it out real quick for me? It's an amazing resource. If you have that, you can pull it out, make copies, and be ready for whatever assessment might happen. So we have the Take Charge for the Future. We interviewed the student. We're going to go over a few of them, but I just already showed you that one. Here's one. Here's a situational, vocational assessment with the student. And he's working on die cuts. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> so he told me he's making groups of 10 die cuts for teachers. So they have like this um, kind of little business in their uh, school where he makes die cuts and he's putting them in, in packets of 10 and then he turns it over when he's finished. So every time he has packets of 10 and he has to make 100, it looks please, like Santa Claus, I'm sorry. And um, he's going to put them all in a bag. Or a teacher and then someone else delivers them and so they have like uh, it's a perfect way to look at what his skills are he sat there for over an hour and did this job he put all of them in, in packets of 10 
He did, um, he followed the, the step directions that were on his card. So I'm looking at him, he can follow four step direction. He worked for an hour. He did a task that, that someone asked him to do without talking to anyone. He's, I'm ready to hire him, right? I could take this out to my job coach and say, this child has these skills. What job out in the community matches these skills? Anyone think of any? Okay, I'm going to do this. So talk to your neighbor and <laughs> see if you can think of a gym. Uh, yes. Warehouse. Warehouse. He's merchandising. He can merchandise. So there we have a possible internship for this student through workability that you found out by just doing a basic situational vocational assessment. And they thought they're setting up a business, but they didn't realize this is you know, transition. Here's another one. This child is out of that. Um, he's actually doing that community-based instruction. And he was trying to be all, he loves Trader Joe's. He loves Trader Joe's. So the SLP, who was an amazing SLP, decided she, he could do my grocery shopping. <laughs> so he's doing her, because there's no money left in the schools, right, to do this kind of thing. <coughs> so this is what she's doing. She said, at this, he's pulling all of them in a bag, he has the money, and then he goes off to pay. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Are you doing, are you taking data on this? No. I go, this is an assessment. This is a community-based assessment. This is someone in the community doing a job, again, matching. He is appropriately look, checking what's on there, grabbing things from the bag, putting them into her bag. It's perfect. And then he goes up, pays his money, and leaves. Is there a job for him out there? Inventory. Inventory. What else could he do? Personal shopper. <laughs> could he work at restocking the shelves? At Trader Joe's, he loves Trader Joe's. He's a child that can learn all this just using a checklist. Again, an assessment that leads to that next step. Um, here is um, Flannery. I don't know if anyone knows Flannery or not. Does anyone know her? She was on the cover of AbleNet forever. Um, she is doing a um, transition profile with Miss Harbell. This is Priscilla Harbell, for those of you who might know her. She is retired now. And um, they're doing a transition profile. Here's someone who's using her device that she uses every day to, to um, work on what are her strengths and what are her weaknesses. And they're putting it up on a gigantic uh, piece of paper. Miss Harbell's writing it. And then it's going to get uh, gets made into a 8 by 11 And it's attached to her transition plan. And that is how she was part of her plan. Again, using one way to access her um, capabilities of communication. <coughs> so this is one where I'm going to have you turn to your neighbor. This is the transition assessment. And this is one that was done, who's from Davis? No one wants to raise your hand. This was done at Davis in the um, teacher room. <laughs> so yeah, turn to your neighbor and figure out, well, what is Kathy Tony doing here? <laughs> you can talk to each other. I'm going to let you talk a little bit. Once we would have said oh, we can't do that. But what we did was we had 
figured out a way for him to do it over time, he can learn. That's why transition assessments need to start at one place and then go over time to see if a child can learn the skill. And he can learn the skill. Now he has the skill of matching that one and belongs to that one paper, but I think he's doing more now. I would like to know where he is now. Um, so these are some of the things that you can think about when you're at your school and you're thinking, I can't get them out in the community. High schools are huge communities. And some of you have huge high schools where you can do different situational assessments and you can try them. Here's a middle school one. This is the child that you might want to think about. Again, I'm going to have to talk to your neighbor. We did a middle school vocational assessment here. Can you see the pictures? One she's doing shredding, and the next one she's cleaning off the table. What is different in each one of those pictures? And what, you know, if this is an assessment, what would you document and how? You can talk to each other or talk to me. <laughs> how much paper she shreds in a minute? How much she shreds, if she shreds at all. Mm -hmm. Can she pull staples out? Can she pull staples out? Off right. Before putting down. And what's really hard to see here, which I don't have my pointer, is that she needs support with this. There's a, a, a paraeducator there where she needs supports. And so that means that when she's doing something at this level that she's probably maybe not too interested in, she's going to need a one to one. We're here, where we just kind of placed it. There's no one supporting her. We told her wipe the table, pick up all the tissue on the table. And she was able to do it without support. So we have to look at why in one situation did she need support and what was the issue in this situation that made her successful. Again, patterns of strengths and weaknesses. And we found out that the shredder makes a ton of noise. And so we figured, ah, it's the noise. And we tried that out and it was true. She didn't like the blender either when we mixed her food, she didn't like that. So with this, she could do it, she could see it, she had visual impairment. So this is another thing that was she could see, it was more concrete. What happens when you shred paper? Do we ever know? <laughs> it just kind of goes away. And so that doesn't wasn't concrete to her, this is really concrete. Wiping the table, putting it into a bag, concrete, something I can do, something I see my mom do, something I see the her educators do. So this is something that was, we could use in transition session for the next steps. Wiping. Wiping the table in any way that she wipes it has a purpose. Yes, it does. As opposed to shredding, which is something you can do individually and, and is repetitious, so repetitious over time. It, it truly is. <laughs> I know, so it was, and yet it's something that all our students do. We all shred paper. So we want to think about that. Is it repetition? Does it have meaning? So when we look at assessment, you can see it's meaningful to her. She was able to do it when it's not meaningful. She wasn't, which is something you would write down on your transition observation form and synthesize it and interpret it for the parents. So another one we have is our transition portfolio. This thing is so old. <laughs> it's like can't hold. This is the one the diagnostics that are put together like that font. No one can read it. Um, so we thought it was really cool. But then, um, the state um, we use them for years and years and years. Portfolios are wonderful for students to keep all their transition assessments in. And a transition assessment can be a community-based instruction, can be this take charge for the future. All these things are in a portfolio for them. And then when they go to their IEPs, because they have to be invited to their IEPs and you have to say how you got all this information, they can say it. And you should start self-directed IEPs uh, at least by 16. They should all be at least at their IEPs and showing a piece of who they are. Because an IEP is about them, for them, about them, everything. Um, so if we would take something like Flannery's picture here and we put it in her portfolio, she could share that at her IEP about who, who she is and what she does. It's, and who, how she feels about herself. These are my strengths. These are my goals. They're not my teacher's goal. They're not my parents' goals. These are my goals. This is my vision for my future. And that's what you want to come out of a, a transition assessment. What are your goals for your future? And she was able to write that and put it in some type of portfolio. You can use a binder like this. You can use there's all these different ones. There's a building life portfolio from, I don't even know if this is around, IEP resources. It's just about independent living. It's not so much about academics. So each one is different, and each one will look different for each student. But 
Polio is an excellent way to build self-determination, self-advocacy, and a way to keep your transition assessments that's portable and can be used in the next situations. So we know they need to occur regularly over time, over a large span of time. Um, it should be um, not completed all at once once before the IEP. I've never done that. So I've done it, I admit it, I did it one time. Um, <laughs> You know, it's planned, it's planned, it's organizing, and there's information for students and their families. It just helps them. That it's really, if we do it right, if we use a multiple measures, and if we really involve the student, it is a powerful tool. It's really powerful. And I'll show you how. So we have a vet. She's 17 years old. Her post-secondary goal, which you'll learn about next time, is to work for a pet groomer. So we did some assessment. Assessment is, oh, she was on the first grade level, WJ. Um, she cries when she gets corrected. That was a situational one. She, but and here's what she likes. She enjoys playing with young children and playing juvenile games. But she wants to be a pet groomer. So over here we look at age-appropriate assessments. So we did one part of assessment. Now we need to do more assessments because what information does she need to read and understand that's related to pet grooming? Dogs, cats, might be where she is or wash, drive, I don't know. We have to do some more assessment. Does she need to know the owner's name? Does she need to know the pet's name? Could she do that? Could it be on a switch for her? Don't know. What coping skills will she need when her boss <coughs> her or corrects her or when a customer is very unhappy with her? She's going to need to have some social emotional um, learning, we call it SEL. So she's going to need to have some coping skills there. Because there is going to be a time, as in everyone's life, when someone yells at you for doing something wrong and she cries. So we can't have that on the job site. We have to you know, learn how to be self-sufficient. Is there a career opportunity that involves both children and pets? Can anyone think of one? I don't know anything. I know one. Dog walker. Dog walker. She could have children and pets. <laughs> I could use that. <laughs> What else would there be? You could work in a petting zoo. <laughs> that was what I just thought of. So, petting zoo, what else could you do? I like the dog walker, children walker, the one. <laughs> I'm using it next time. Therapy dogs at a children's hospital. Therapy dog. Very good. Yay. <laughs> Therapy dog at a children's hospital. So, those are things you could do. Does that meet her goal of wanting to be a pet groomer? Probably. Because what she wants is to interact with the, with the dogs. <laughs> However, we need to do more assessment to learn more assessment. Because we went back, we realized, oh yeah, she has some weaknesses here. We have that basic assessment, but if we put it into what she really wants to do, we need to have some more. That is how assessment just keeps building and building and building and building, and how people make life out of assessment. So many things are made. It's just, remember, it's just collecting everything you possibly can about a student, synthesizing it for the parents and interpreting it for the student. What else have we got? So summary. That was quick. I told you wow. Um, it's part of IDEA. Transition assessment is part of IDEA. It is. It doesn't say a whole lot about what we have to do or how we have to do it, but it does say we have to do it. It is. Um, it targets critical areas of adult life that can encompass a variety of approaches. It does say that. It should be used for identifying students' interests and preferences, always. Determining and looking at, I added that, post-school goals and outcomes. Developing relevant learning experiences, such as instruction and, and transition needs. It also helps to identify linkages to next steps. When a child is leaving, you can start to look at it when they're you know, sophomores and juniors, what that might look like. Where is this student going based on their dreams? And it helps you evaluate instruction and support, such as we did back here with uh, Yvette. Looking at, well, she's going to need more support. We're going to need to put in different types of structure. So we can look at all those different areas if we use it. Two critical pieces I can't talk more about is self-determination. Having students really understand who they are. How many of you teachers and parents out there think your <coughs> students and children can advocate for themselves if they had to? Yeah. There's um, kind of a mixed bag here. I have two children. <laughs> Adult children. I got a phone call the other day, I'm like, what? <laughs> You've 
lost both keys to your car and you want me to do what? <laughs> and you live in St. Louis? I have to wear my things I can't do. I'm just shocked. So no, you <laughs> can't. And, and person center planning is the other one. It offers a you know, strategy and structure how you can get parents and the community involved in children's assessments, which we rarely do. But these are now young adults who are going to be stepping out of the K-12 system and into the adult world. And we have to get them ready to do that at all levels and at the level of their support. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.